today I want to invite you to take a tangible step of care for the people of Ukraine. Most of you know that over the past couple of weeks, the fragile peace that has existed between Ukraine and Russia has been broken. And Ukraine is now the scene of battles, the likes of which have not been experienced in Europe for decades. Lives are being lost, hundreds of thousands of people are uprooted and fleeing, many stores are closed, cash and food is running out, prices are skyrocketing, it's chaotic and very sad. Some of you have significant personal connection to Ukraine. Lots of people in our denomination do, as the Mennonite Brethren family started in the very region that is currently under attack. And here at Willingdon, we have a bunch of people who have immigrated to Canada from Ukraine. So this is a very personal, emotional experience for you. Our church family has real friendships with people and churches in Ukraine. We have visited, we have sent short-term mission teams, we've hosted virtual cooking classes, we've taught discovery classes virtually, we've contributed financially to various needs. So in the midst of this moment of pain and crisis in Ukraine, how can we respond? I invite you to respond today in two ways. The first is to pray. If you were at one of our in-person services last weekend, you'll remember a beautiful prayer time we had for Ukraine, led by Roman, the leader of our Russian language ministry. I'd like to invite you to keep praying. Here's an idea for you. Would you set an alarm on your phone and pray for Ukraine every day this month at the same time? I've set my alarm for 9 a.m. You can join me at that time or pick another time. But please pray for God to intervene and to provide in the midst of this crisis. Second, I invite you to give generously to provide aid in this time of need. Any funds you contribute will be forwarded to Multiply, formerly MB Mission, which is our primary partner organization serving in Ukraine. Multiply has a long track record of effective ministry in Ukraine. They serve alongside the network of 25 Mennonite Brethren churches there, all of whom have been catapulted into a moment of extreme need. Multiply workers are actively discerning how to meet the growing immediate needs of people both inside Ukraine and those who have fled the country in these last days. So please give generously. You can either give online by selecting Ukraine in the drop-down box of fund options, or you can give in person by using one of these purple envelopes. Thank you for your care. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your generosity. Hello and welcome to Willingdon Church's online service. We're so glad that you're here to join us. If it's your first time joining us online, you can check out our connect card and fill that in so you, we can get you more involved in the church. If you have any prayers items or prayer requests that you would like to let us know about, you can fill out our prayer card and there will be a team of people praying for you throughout the week. We love hearing about the things that are going on in your life and would be so happy to hear from you. Another way to get connected here at Willingdon is to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll let you know about the different things that are happening throughout the week or special events that are coming up in that newsletter sent out every week. Kids and families, day camp is coming up. On March 13th, we're gonna have our priority registration opening. And this registration is for anybody that is bringing friends that don't regularly go to church. So if that's you and if you have some friends, Come visit the Kids Info Desk and we'll get you signed up. Hello friends, my name is David Song and I'm the coordinator of WSBM, Willingdon School of Bible and Ministry. WSBM exists to equip the people of God, head, heart, and hands with God's Word, helping them to know Jesus Christ personally and carry on His ministry. And I'm delighted to announce to you five courses that we'll be offering this spring from April to early June. We have Praying the Psalms Part 2, Prison Letters to the Philippians, Basics of Biblical Hebrew, Caring for Seniors, and Global Mission of the Church in the 21st Century. Now, you don't have to have taken Praying the Psalms Part 1 in order to take Part 2. In other words, it's not cumulative. But this course invites students to lifelong practice of praying the Psalms well. Prison Letter to the Philippians, looks at the letter as a whole and offers many opportunities to read it exegetically, meaning drawing out the meaning of the text rather than importing the alien meaning onto the text. 
Basics of Biblical Language of Hebrew introduces the Hebrew alphabet and basic grammar. And please, don't feel intimidated by this. Believe it or not, language courses tend to be the easiest and most rewarding courses. Caring for Seniors is a course designed to equip you with necessary skills to help older people, whether in long-term care settings or in their own houses, discover the pathways to meaningful aging. Finally, Global Mission of the Church in the 21st Century examines the current realities of global outreach and provides practical ways in which students can discern and engage with what God is doing in our city and our world today. Please have a look at our courses on our website, willingdon.org slash WSBM, early bird discount, as well as a huge group discount for a group of four or more ends on the last Sunday of March. Looking forward to journeying with you this spring. Another way that we like to worship here at Willingdon Church is through our tithes and offering. So let's pray for that before we head into service. Dear God, we just thank you for the gifts that you have given us and the way that it is used here at Willingdon. We just ask that you be blessing the funds as they are coming in and would those be used to further your kingdom and be used for the good of this congregation. God, in all this I pray, in Jesus' precious name, amen. So why don't you stand and get ready to join us in worship. Your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus. 
Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into His grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Today, I have the privilege of giving the first sermon in this new series in Romans chapters 5 to 8. It's a series that's actually called Confident. Now, this is more of a relaunch. We were going through Romans until June of last year. And at that time, we finished chapter 4 with a message, coincidentally given by someone named Roman. The last words of chapter 4 were about Jesus being raised to life for our justification. Chapter 5 begins with the words, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. So in the first four chapters, Paul has described at length what it means to be justified by faith. To us, the words sound technical, clinical, theological, and I suppose a little on the dull side. But it's actually a wonderfully rich image. He pictures the entire world like a big court of law. Now, that in itself isn't the most exciting of things. I've visited a few courtrooms, once to accompany a young criminal, another time to see a lawyer friend in action. And yes, in my experience, courtrooms are about as exciting as laundromats. But in Paul's discussion of the courtroom, we are actually there as the people on trial. Now, that makes the image more compelling. And not only are you and I in the courtroom as criminals, we are like people who have been found trafficking drugs in certain countries, where the death sentence is inevitable for such a crime. And to make the situation even worse, evidence against us is overwhelming, and we have no defense attorney. The game is over. We're completely finished. We are on death row awaiting execution. Then suddenly... The judge finds a way to change the verdict. He puts forward his own son to stand in my place, to take my guilty verdict and even my death sentence. It sounds ludicrous. But this person I'm standing before is not only the judge, he's the king as well, and he can do whatever he wants to do. But it still sounds strange and unjust, scandalous even, that the judge's son, who didn't do anything wrong, would be allowed to take my punishment. It's an undeserved and sacrificial kindness. Grace is the word that's usually used. And my only response is to humble myself and receive the gift. It's either that or death. So in the first chapters of Romans, we are a people who are born into sin, baptized in sin, and swimming in sin. This is what's wrong with us. None is righteous. No, not one. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Every mouth is stopped. The whole world is held accountable to God. Now, we can hear this description of human beings and make one of two responses. We could say, that's not me. I'm not that bad. I shovel the sidewalk in the winter. I drive the speed limit. I've never shoplifted. We can argue our own innocence, and I suppose that is what many of us do much of the time. We justify ourselves. We shift the blame. Now, we learned that from Adam, who said the words, It was the woman you gave me. She made me do it. But if I find myself in the description, if I see that there's truly a disease that has made me, little old me, jealous and gossipy, boastful and faithless, a slanderer and insolent, just a few words that Paul uses in the description, if I can see myself as that, it's one of the happiest days of my life. Augustine famously called this, oh, happy sin. (laughs) It's like going to the doctor after suffering from a long chronic pain, and the doctor makes a correct diagnosis. The light goes on, and we say, oh, that's what's wrong with me. The problem is not my irritating spouse or defiant kids or noisy neighbor or lazy co-workers or unreasonable boss. The biggest issue of the day isn't the trucker convoy or the government's response. The thing that's wrong is actually me. And when you've got a terminal illness, how much do other things really matter? But when the doctor makes a correct diagnosis, well, then I'm ready for the cure. 
And by accepting that diagnosis and then the cure, the grace and forgiveness of God through the blood of His own Son, we enter into a new reality. We enter into chapter 5, where Paul begins to explain the life of justified people. How do we know we truly believe something and we think that thing is important? That something will affect the way I live in very real ways. God has rewired us. Paul offers three big words that now mark our lives as new people justified by God, peace, hope, and love. First, we have peace with God, verses 1 and 2. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible describes the peace of God and peace from God. The prepositions of and from tell us that true peace has a source, and if we really want to experience, we simply have to go to that source. The phrase peace with God is a bit different. This means that two former enemies have now become close friends. Near the beginning of this letter, Paul wrote, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people. The problem is stated at the outset, the wrath of God. So in this letter, Paul has moved us from being under the wrath of God to being at peace with God. The anger of God towards our sin is over, and there's not one little bit of hostility in God's heart toward us. The Old Testament book of Isaiah described war-torn Israel being terrorized by violent forces. Their villages had been destroyed, houses burned down, they didn't have food to eat or water to drink. Now, it's hard for us to imagine this because most of our generation hasn't experienced war, but that was indeed the experience of some of our parents. My dad's family, for example, lost everything at the hands of revolutionary soldiers. They were forced to flee for their lives. Israel's situation in Isaiah's day was like that, only their main problem was actually themselves and God's anger towards their sin. Like us in Romans, they had to stop looking for the source of their problem in their leaders or their circumstances, but to trace it back to their own hearts. The wrath of God was being revealed against them in very specific ways. And then suddenly, Isaiah 40, verse 1, the message changes, just like it does for us here in Romans 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare has ended that her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The war is over. A little later in Isaiah, we come to that great prophecy of the suffering servant, chapter 53, where we read those words, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. To these people who had suffered greatly because of their sin, Isaiah pronounced peace, comfort, and grace. Peace. It means that our warfare has truly ended. We now live as if everything is completely and eternally okay. God is more than just okay with me. He deeply loves me and only wants what is best. There's no longer an enemy that can truly hurt me. I'm completely safe for the rest of my life and for all eternity. And I just should say, as a side note, spiritual warfare is also a reality for Christians, but it isn't our major reality. In Romans, there's very little said about the devil, and in most of the other New Testament letters, the same is true. The major reality for us, the major way we are to think, is not warfare, but peace. We need to be aware of the enemy, but realize that he's no longer a threat to us. With the Spirit's help, we need to get into our minds that we are truly at peace with God. In describing this passage, Pastor Mike Winger discusses, discusses the difference between true peace and a ceasefire. A ceasefire can offer a mixture of peace and uncertainty. There's the lingering possibility of war. Will we do something to make the other side mad? Will they start shooting at us again? And we sometimes think of our relationship with God in that way. Have I done something to make God mad at me? Did my business dry up because God doesn't like me anymore? In a ceasefire, we'd better watch out because the other side still has soldiers patrolling the area, and it won't take much for the bullets to start flying again. 
No, <laughs> the warfare has ended. God has given us double for all our sins. As much as we have sinned against God, His grace is twice as great. As the old hymn says, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. But here is something even more important. The gospel story, which is what the letter to the Romans is describing, is not mostly about my sin. It's about God and His reign of peace over all things. The problem, the thing that has disrupted God's peaceful reign was in fact our sin. My sin, multiplied by the over seven billion people in this world, has turned this planet into a place of war, pollution, ongoing grudges, and diseases. And when God solved that problem of sin through our Lord Jesus Christ, He began to reign over a new creation, over you and I as newly created people. It can sometimes feel like on our territorial planet, life is one big game of risk. <laughs> Which country will hold the balance of power? Which party should we align ourselves with? But the gospel is about, in the words of N.T. Wright, how God became king. He took up a throne not with tanks and weapons and technology, but with an act of sacrifice. To have peace with God means that we not only, He not only likes us, but that He's working out all things for our good. And we have aligned ourselves with the winning side. Do you believe it? Now you have to if you have been justified by faith because that word faith means much more than an assent to doctrine. Faith is the entire orientation of my whole being, body, soul, thoughts, and emotions into a complete trust that God is fully in control. Guns may be firing outside my door. The MRI I just received is suspicious. A flood has destroyed my land. The boss is about to fire me, but I believe that I believe that I believe God is in control control. In the previous chapter, Paul had been writing about Abraham, who he called the father of us all. And he, he said that we share the faith of Abraham. The story of Abraham is mostly about an elderly couple well past the age of being able to have children, never having children, but being told by God that they would. And with each passing year, the promise grew more and more impossible. Abraham first heard it from God at age 75 when his wife Sarah was 65, already a sheer impossibility. There's no IVF, surrog surrogacy and op ad uh, adoptions were not options. So at age 80, there's still no child, none at 90, and none at 95. Our story begins with an empty womb, and the father of faith is an old man who believed that God could put life into a dead womb. That's how our story begins. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. When Abraham was a hundred, Sarah ninety, their son was born. Life had come into a dead womb, and Abraham, the father of our faith, believed it would. In the impossibilities of life, people of faith believe that God is truly the king, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, Paul wrote, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Verse 2. The reign of God through our Lord Jesus is filled with grace. Peace describes our relationship with God, and grace describes what I possess in God. Think now for a moment about the most generous person you've ever known. I'm thinking of my own father. <laughs> he didn't ever possess an awful lot, but he could not but give away what he had. If you parked your car in his driveway, visited him for an hour, you'd find your oil had been changed. If you washed dishes in his house, he'd hand you a $20 bill. Sort of in fun, but so much more than that. My dad was wired to give. But if you multiply the most generous person you know by a million, we're still not in the range of God's generosity. It is in God's very nature to give. He is the God of all grace. And this is the basis, Jesus said, for prayer. If we know how to give good gifts to our own children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give to us? So we come to, to Him in prayer constantly, knowing that He loves us. He loves to hear us. He loves to give to us. Why does it mean so much to God that we ask from Him in prayer? Because He knows when we ask, we truly understand we are His children who know Him to be the giver of good gifts. Let's do our best to not waste the grace. Through Jesus, we have been given access by faith into this grace by which we stand. 
The access is like a doorway. It was a word used for a door on a ship. In our case, it's more like the doorway into the palace where the king is seated on the throne. And here we stand before the king of all grace, his generous hands always open and outstretched, telling us that all he possesses is ours. We are heirs of everything together with our Lord Jesus. Second, we hope in God's glory and our sufferings, verses 3 and 4. Not only that, Paul goes on, (laughs) and here he begins to sound like one of those late-night infomercials, but wait, there's more. The peace we have in God spills into the future as we ponder what is to come. The future is a scary place for many of us. No one can see it, but we often live with a worst-case scenario type of thinking, especially for those who are naturally pessimists, and I know you like to call yourself realists, have their mantras if I can only go downhill from here, and this can only get worse. How different from the old Saint Hildegard, who was most famous for saying, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. (laughs) No matter how you score in Myers-Briggs, no matter what kind of personality you have, there is no room for pessimism before the throne of God. There are three things about the hope we now have. First, we are ultimately hoping for the revelation of God's glory. Later in Romans, Paul would write that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Peter exhorted the church in another letter, set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your eye on the prize. Second, the hope seeps into our suffering. Verse 3, we rejoice in our sufferings. The word rejoice is literally boast, which seems like a strange thing to say. We boast in our sufferings. Now, I might boast about winning a race, but why would I boast in my suffering? And what's even stranger is that these words were written by a Jewish scholar who came from a tradition that saw suffering as a sign of God's judgment. In his tradition, if you were suffering, it could only mean that God is mad at you. But now, for people who stand in grace before the king who rules over everything, suffering becomes something different, something redemptive, something of value in my life. Suffering is no longer a problem to solve. It's something to embrace together with the God of all grace, the God whose strength is made perfect in my weakness. And third, suffering matures us. What are the benefits of suffering? It produces endurance. Like people training for a marathon, the sore muscles are signs of potential strength so that tomorrow's workout will be a bit better than today's. If I can make it through the pain of today and then the pain of tomorrow and then the pain of the next day, I'm building some reserves within myself. I will not be a quitter. Suffering builds spiritual muscle, and we can't get that by reading a book. Spiritual muscle is developed through pain. And God, the great trainer, knows exactly where we are weak and which exercises we need. Endurance produces character. This word character refers to the product of a test, something that results only by being tested, like gold refined by fire, Peter would write to suffering Christians. Our suffering is is making us into better people, more full of faith in the God of grace. And then we're back to hope again. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. In the body of Christ, it seems that God, in His wisdom, has called some into particularly painful suffering. One of the most well-known in our generation is Johnny Erickson Tata, who broke her neck in a diving accident as a teenager and has lived as a quadriplegic for 50 years. In a talk that she gave titled, Hope the best of things, she says. Do you know who the truly handicapped people are? They are the ones, and many of them are Christians, who hear the alarm clock go off at 7.30 in the morning, throw back the covers, jump out of bed, take a quick shower, choke down breakfast, and zoom out the front door. They do all this on automatic pilot without stopping once to acknowledge their creator, their great God who gives them life and strength each day. Christian, if you live that way, Do you know that James 4, 6 says that God opposes you? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And who are the humble? 
They are the people who are humiliated by their weaknesses, catheterized people whose leg bag, bags spring leaks on somebody else's brand new carpet, immobilized people who must be fed, cleansed, dressed, and taken care of like infants, once active people crippled by chronic aches and pains. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So then submit yourselves to God. The role of suffering is to strip away our resources, reveal our poverty, poverty of spirit, and purify our hope in God himself and in God alone. And Paul writes that this hope will not disappoint us. Third and finally, we have God's love, 5 verse 5. Why doesn't hope disappoint us? Well, here is something that seems at first like a strange answer. Because the love of God, Paul says, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What does the love of God have to do with the hope that doesn't disappoint us? Later in this letter, we'll see that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. Suffering, instead of making us think that God doesn't love us, has the opposite effect. It reminds us of the reasons to hope in God with a hope that never disappoints and to be renewed with the knowledge that God's love is without condition now and forever. I love this word poured. It's something we do all the time. <laughs> now, I happen to believe that coffee is one of God's greatest physical gifts to the human race. One of my first acts every morning is to pour coffee from the urn into my cup. The smell is altogether delightful, and I anticipate the first sip because from that cup, the coffee then gets poured into my body. Pouring is the act that fills an empty vessel, and the pouring of something good into an empty soul is entirely satisfying. God's love has been poured into our hearts. We who were impoverished, who had been objects of wrath, who had no peace, no grace, no joy, no hope, are now filled with the love of God. There's a couple of goals for this long letter. One of the main ones will be chapters 14 and 15, where this church at Rome, comprised of very different people, will be urged to accept one another just as Christ has accepted them. And here in Romans 5, we get a foretaste of this message. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It was God himself who did this, just like I pour coffee into my body, so God pours his love into my heart. And the effects of the coffee are quick and wonderful, at least until the adrenaline rush ends. But the love of God that has filled my soul is no short-term fix. It completely rewires my whole person. And when I meet a brother or sister who is unlovable, or worse yet, when I encounter an actual enemy, I can look to God again who keeps pouring more and more love into my heart. You and I, through Jesus, have been rewired to love. We don't have to live with simmering irritations, with grudges and hostile relationships. You who are loved by God now possess the power to love way beyond what you thought you were capable of. Real and sustained love is truly a miracle. One early Greek philosopher who had become a Christian wrote a letter to the emperor, and in that letter he described Christians with these words, Behold how they love one another. He had never seen anything like it. How will you know that you truly believe you have been justified, declared innocent by God himself? Simply by this new and unexplainable love you have for God and others. That person closed the letter with these words, This is a new people. There's something divine in the midst of them. And may the people of Metro Vancouver stand amazed at our love and conclude that it's only a miracle and know that God must be in our midst. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would take these words of Romans 5, written so long ago, about the wonderful gifts we have, all because you have said we're justified by faith. Take this message and make it real in our hearts. Make our peace with you real to us. Make our grace in which we stand real to us. Make the experience of hope in our lives real. And we ask that you would open our eyes to understand more deeply the measure of love you have poured into our hearts. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. To that end we pray in his name. Amen. There will be a couple of reflection questions for you on the screen. So I invite you just to take a little bit of time in quiet and reflect a little more deeply on the Word of God. God bless. Today we'll have communion together, and I hope that you have some bread and juice for us to uh, partake together. Uh, this is one of our oldest traditions in the church, and the bread, of course, represents the body of our Lord Jesus, and the cup represents his, represents his blood. The Apostle Paul said that God has shown us great love in that while we were sinners, our Lord Jesus died for us. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he reminded them as they come together to eat to celebrate the body and blood <clears throat> of their Lord Jesus because Jesus is in their midst. So these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I'm just going to give thanks for the bread and for the cup, and then we'll partake together. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you became for us. Thank you that you lived among us, you walked among us, and you revealed God to us. And then you paid the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate price by going to the cross. Your body was broken for us, and your blood was shed for us. So today as we receive the bread and the cup, we ask that your Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts again, to understand and comprehend more deeply the deep love that you have for us that is unconditional and eternal. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, as often as you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you, do, you drink this cup, do so in, in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Paul wrote that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Our God, we thank you for the gospel that has be, been proclaimed to us, the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you today through this simple exercise of eating the bread and drinking the cup, we now proclaim the gospel to ourselves and to the world of your great love for us. It's the most important thing that's ever happened in the history 
of the human race. And thank you that you revealed it to us and you've saved us through our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.
Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week. Bye.